Welcome, sports fans. This is Kevin. That is Jake. And this is the Mr. Teacher, Mr. Preacher YouTube channel and podcast, where it is our job to learn what lasts in athletics and share it back with you, athletes, coaches, parents of the greater sporting world. Welcome. Great to have you. Um, super excited to learn along with you today. Um, today's episode is our third installment on the theme of friendship. We are going through John Wynn's pyramid of success 75 years later, as of this recording, um, to see what we can see. What do we learn about each of these themes and how it applies to sports? And also, how and why did John or Coach Wooden pick these things um, in order to be a success and what he considers a success? Um, so today we're going to be covering the teammates and uh, deconstructing a friendship that lasted 60 to 70 years between four famous Boston Red Sox players. But before we get to that, we got to tell you where you can get your book, and that is bookshop.org. Bookshop.org is our underdogs of the book selling world. They support independent bookstores throughout the United States. So when you buy from bookshop.org, you know your money is going to those underdogs in the book world. So if you would like to get the teammates, this episode is of interest to you. Check out bookshop.org. That is in the link below. Um, it is one place you can get your books and you can feel good about your purchase. Jake, uh, we are, like I said, in our third installment of Friendship. The first one was The Good Life. Uh, that was all about that Harvard Grant study and what do we learn about relationships being this core component of life over the long term. That was kind of that overarching view. Last episode was Coach Wooden and Me. That was by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So we were looking at that player-coach relationship and, and, and how that progresses. We talked very at length about the stages of the player-coach relationship, um, especially between two very different people, Wooden and Kareem. Uh, couldn't be any more different as people, personalities, players, uh, and so forth. And this episode, I wanted to really dive into more of that player-to-player -player relationship by examining um, four teammates who were not only good players, but were friends for the long term. And that is our four Boston Red Sox, as evidence in David Halberstam's The Teammates, A Portrait of Friendship. And the four teammates are Johnny Pesky, Bobby Dewar, Ted Williams, and Dom or Dominic DiMaggio. And that is where we're gonna see is we're gonna look at what does friendship look like for people who've gone the distance, who've went to the, the beginning, middle, and end of their lifetimes together. And what do we learn about friendship from these four? To start us off, to focus the reader and the listener, I want to talk about the 60-year debate between Ted Williams and Bobby Dewar. And I'm going to do a little bit of this by memory, but Ted Williams was the famed hitter of the Boston Red Sox. Very passionate about hitting, and that is an understatement. Loved hitting. Wrote a book on hitting. And he had a debate with Bobby Dewar for 60 years about the ideal swing. And the argument was a part of the Ted Williams lecture series. Um, he just had to be the judge and jury of everything. And what ended up happening is they were 67 years old. This is in the middle of the book. And they had a row. Ted Williams said, I can't teach a dang thing to Bobby Dewar about anything about hitting. I don't know what's wrong with him. He just won't listen. He was immensely frustrated by the fact that Dewar, a very good natural hitter, was not as passionate about the subject as he was. And so he was frustrated that Bobby chopped at the ball when Ted thought it should be a slight upswing. And it culminated in this fishing trip where you just had two old, gruff baseball players having five minutes to debate their side of the topic of what should be the ideal swing and what is the approach to hitting. And over the course of these three days, it's interesting. I would kill for this, Jake. You want to talk about memorabilia? Somebody caught this argument on video camera. So they have Ted Williams and Bobby Dewar on video camera, five minutes, men gathered around and 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 the writer, you know, the author says, you know, can you imagine the scene batting practice on the Rogue River during steelhead season? And they don't say who won because apparently Ted Williams just won every argument. But I want to ask you about 
60 year debate and friendship. So tell me like a contentious topic, like let's debate something. So all good friends, friendship, seeming to debate players they liked, players they loathe, uh, bold opinions. So tell me, it doesn't even have to be between us, but what is a bold opinion you have or an ongoing argument debate that you've had between <laughs> friends? And tell me your side of it and why you won't let it go. Maybe you're you're in the right, maybe you're not. But tell me about this 60-year debate. This is a really good place to start for this book. Uh, we'll, we'll play full and we'll stick with baseball. That's Joe Maurer being a Hall of Famer or not. I'm I'm in the category that Joe Maurer is not a baseball Hall of Famer. Uh, and most people that I know, especially from Minnesota, will debate the opposite of that. And that's kind of a soapbox that I stand on, right, wrong, or otherwise. Are you on no, an eye? Okay. I, I, hold on. I, I pulled this up, right? So we're talking about Bobby Dew. We're talking about Ted Williams. We're talking about who's the better hitter, how to hit appropriately. Okay. 288, 223 home runs, 2,042 hits. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Versus a 344 career batting average, 521 home runs, and 2,654 hits. Who do you think won that argument? Absolutely, Williams. And he had years of service because he served in both. Um, he served in Korea and World War II. Right. So I mean, I remember hearing his projected stats through his prime, and they were just they made Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron look not quite as good as they were. I mean, obviously they're all time players, but Williams at scale was something else. He probably yeah. would have had another four hundred season. Oh, probably. And in fairness, Bobby Dewar did miss a year as well. For military mm -hmm. service, but not until 1945, which we just won't comment on that out of respect to Bobby Dewar. But I am on an island, the Joe Maher thing. I am mostly on an island. There's not that many people that will get behind me like, ah, I have enough. especially in Minnesota, right? From Minnesota, a lot of these discussions come from uh, between me and other Minnesotans. And I think part of the reason I get on that soapbox is because he's so loved. <laughs> there that I feel like it makes mm -hmm. people irrational. That would be the argument. He is indeed a Hall of Fame person. To, now we could go back and forth on this. I would tend to agree with you, just looking at the stats. The argument for he's a catcher, like for a part of his career, he kind of has the Sandy Koufax argument, like for his like period of catching. But I don't think it was long enough. I think he's a tragic story. I wish he would have been a catcher all the way through. That's that's my thing is um, his value plummeted after he stopped catching, which is sad because it wasn't his fault. And, you know, he was who he was. But you can clearly see there was a catcher Mauer and a first baseman Mauer. Mm -hmm. And I think the some of the Hall of Fame is longevity. And unless you put up the five best catching seasons of all time, and I think he just had one. Maybe two. I, I don't think you can argue. And I love the guy. I'm a Minnesotan through and through. I, I Even I have a hard time with that. Maybe he'll get voted in by the committee once he's ineligible. I don't know. That's a good debate. That's a Because you probably fought that one a couple times. Oh, absolutely. And I know some of your other friends, and they would they would they probably have the jaws on the floor that you even suggest such a heresy, Jake. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe okay. it's it's one that I go to bat for. I just I'm um, I don't quite super great human Hall of Fame talent. I just he just didn't do it long enough. I'm sorry, and you get this weird like one year flash in the pan where the guy actually hit some homers, actually drives in some runs, and then nothing. No. For anybody out there, is Joe Joe Mara Hall of Famer or not? Let us know. Uh, it'd be hilarious if you just steamrolled Jake with yes, because I would be amused by that. But if you're on his side, I, maybe you can take up the argument with us and, and let us know all the statistical reasons why or why not. I like that. To jump into the book, okay? So what is this book about? The Teammates, A Portrait of Friendship. And just a few summary items as we get into our first draft reading, which is our segment called Puzzle the Preacher. So I like to throw questions at Jake, usually between 10 and 20. Um, about the book as a way of comprehending. That's what a first draft reading of a book is, just comprehension um, about the book. It gets us warmed up after that initial topic. So this book is about 
friendship. It's a monument to friendship, as the opening forward by Jane Levy says. Between these four athletes, there is actually an, a monument um, outside of Fenway of these four. Um, it's about four men who grew up together and grew old together and together would figure out how to help the greatest of them die. Great, great sentence, by the way. Love that. Um, and so as we go forward, we get a look of this friendship through these four, much more of a historical perspective. This is way different than Kareem or The Good Life, which was much more practical. This is more of a historical account. So if you do read this book, understand that you maybe need to be a little bit of a baseball fan. Um, but our job is to extract those lessons for you um, so you can um, take them away for friendship. The idea behind the book for this author was that Ted Williams was dying and the idea for a final trip to visit him, driving down to Florida to see him one last time, was Dominic DiMaggio's. So it's this road trip to go see Ted as his health is failing him um, between uh, an, uh, a famed sports writer of the area, Dick Flavin, and two of the players. Um, all four of them were men of a certain generation, born right at the end of World War I within 31 months of each other. Um, and then the only other thing I want to say before we really jump in is one more, a little bit of a, a summary here. There was, that was something un unusual about baseball and you could agree or disagree with the baseball part. Four men who played for one team, who became good friends and who remain friends for the rest of their lives. That's a rarity in of itself. We'll circle back to that. You know, why is that important? Their lives were forever linked through a thousand box scores, through long hours of traveling on trains together, through shared moments of triumph, and even more in the case of the Red Sox, through shared moments of disappointment. So that is the gist of this, is we have four very distinct men with their own personalities, their own strengths, weaknesses as players and as people, and we get to get a glimpse of them and what it did look like, that portrait of friendship through this book. And we'll save those lessons for how did these guys become friends and stay friends for the long haul. That's the point of this episode. But let's puzzle the preacher. Jake, I got 15 questions, rapid fire. Let's test your knowledge. Um, I was a little bit graceful to you in my selections of types of questions, but let's see what you can get. So can you beat the preacher? Puzzle the preacher. Number one, Jake, what was Ted Williams' nickname? Why don't I know this? You should know it because it's very simple. <laughs> oh, of course, the first thing that pops in my head is the salt and swat. Oh, it's shorter than that. That's about the only. Oh, my goodness. I haven't said this in forever. Ted the blank Williams. Yeah, this is embarrassing. This, this is why it's funny. This is good viewing, Jake. This is why. What is it? It's the kid. Ted the kid. It's not one you would... It's To give yourself some grace, it's not what you can usually figure. Number two, true or false, the service, Ted Williams' funeral service at in Boston, I think in 2002, was his only memorial service. True or false? False. That is actually true. So the reason why is, do you remember the whole debacle over like freezing his remains so that we can right. resurrect yeah. Ted Williams? They never, ever had another funeral. So like they had this memorial service at Fenway and that was it. There was no private, like actual ceremony outside of that one. Unbelievable. You don't need a body to do that. Back then. And there's a reason why, because he was definitely taken advantage of by his family, especially yeah. if you remember, remember, it is very sad. Um, over under 50 years, Jake, Johnny Pesky spent as a part of the Red Sox organization. Uh, true. That is true. He, I think it was 60 years. So like there was a brief period where Dan Duquette, remember when he, he was the GM, like mm -hmm. kind of pushed away the old players cause they're trying to do new stuff and everybody hated them for it. And then Henry took over and then they brought back Pesky, but yeah, he was with the organization a long, long time. Mm -hmm. zero one two or three how many cigars did johnny pesky smoke a day <laughs> uh, let's go with two it is two 
Johnny Pesky, true or false, his nickname was Needle Nose. True. It is true. He had a big nose, I guess. Over, under, or push. Dominic DiMaggio, okay, center fielder extraordinaire for the Red Sox, mm -hmm. is, during his best years, did he make over, under, or push $40,000 a year? Go oh, under. I, I should give it to you because that's what uh, Pesky had, but it would have been push. I'll give you half credit. So he had he made forty grand a year. Forty grand a year. This is the forties and fifties, like his peak years. That seems like a lot of money in it the forties and fifties. It still seems like nothing at the same time. I agree with oh, you and yes. disagree. Maybe that'll be our sixty year debate. Um, <laughs> which Red Sox um, reminded? Ted Williams of Joe DiMaggio, and I'll give you a decade, the 90s, and I'm not sure when he retired, 2000s. As a hitter, he was also right-handed. I will not tell you his position because I'll make it too easy. Who reminded Ted Williams of Joe DiMaggio? Um, are you just saying 90s? He was an infielder. Prominent Red Sox. Uh, no more Garcia Parra. That is absolutely correct. He's Speaking like, of teammates, because this is topical, did you know that David Ortiz had no idea what Dustin Pedroia's first name was? No, but that is hilarious. Is he's even not, he's not, no, but that's all. That, puzzle the preacher, why don't you? Puzzle, like, tickle the, I'd, I don't know. Jeez. I'd have to pull it up exactly, but Ortiz would call Pedroia something. All the time, and, it, and Dustin just let it go, thinking, "No, it's just a nickname, whatever, no big deal." And okay, mind you, David Ortiz hit behind Dustin Pedroia for it's years. On, it's on the scoreboard for years, okay. And it finally, they're both retired. They, someone comes up to Pedroia at some event and says, "Hey, Dustin, how you doing?" That, and immediately Ortiz is like, "What do you call you? Call me Dustin, Poppy. Call me Dustin." Why do you call you that? Because that's my name. No, it's not. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know if that makes Ortiz more endearing or less <laughs> endearing. Like a little bit of both, because like it is his personality. Uh -huh. But at the same time, like you gotta at least know the dude's name. Oh, that's great. Jeez. Okay. Number eight. True or false, Jake? Mm -hmm. Carl Yes Yaz Yastremsky. Yeah. Wouldn't fish with Ted Williams because he couldn't bring beer on the boat. True. That is true. So Ted Williams was so stinking anal. Yaz showed up one day and Ted's like, hey, what's in the cooler? He's like, beer. He's like, I don't have beer in my boat. Yaz is like, I'm out. <laughs> he just left. <laughs> one of the funniest pictures of all time. Because one, I respect, respect Yastrzemski. The other one is, as I can see that interaction, like this old <laughs> Ted Williams and this... Peak y Yastrzemski. That's hilarious. Okay. Um, oh, this one was just as good. Which fo famous former college basketball coach went fishing with Ted Williams and the author? He had an equally, I will give you a little bit of a hint, fiery personality as Ted Williams. I mean, can we say John Wooden for the sake of everything that's going on in this this podcast? No, it's got to be it's got to be more recent. I would say he was great in the eighties and nineties. It's all I'm gonna yeah. Jimmy Valvano. It was it was actually Bobby Knight. <laughs> Can you imagine? This is why I wrote it down as one of these questions. Could you imagine this author, historian, great writer, Ted Williams, and Bobby Knight on a boat? I just cannot fathom that. Like this is just an interesting picture. Yeah, I'd say I think I think you have to count that one as correct for me because you described Bobby Knight as having a little bit of a fiery personality. I think that might be the biggest understatement that's ever been made. Yes, like I just can't like fire and fire next to each other. I'm surprised they didn't kill one another. Uh, Ted Williams, true or false, hated neckties. True. That is true. He refused. There's even pictures of him like gnawing at it. Um True or false, during the Korean War, Ted Williams crash-landed his plane. 
false is actually true he thought it would save his leg so he made this calculated decision i just amused that he was able to do that and he survived it and he came away unscathed um which national league central division team as it currently stands in the divisions was ted williams almost sold to besides the red sox it's a good question national league central um cincinnati reds it was the chicago cubs ah. ted williams drew comparison to this very famous country western actor and in fact they considered him the real version of this very very well known name john, john wayne Hustler. it is john wayne mm -hmm. they said that he was actually the real john wayne because john wayne didn't serve in the military and then ted williams did john wayne was a you know outdoorsman but ted Williams was a big big fisherman anyways number 14 two more um oh so when ted williams came back from korea now all of his buddies had been traded or whatever he came back to a very young team because this is his late 30s now he almost played outfield with this san francisco giants legend because this player was kind of in that Boston Red Sox farm system with the Barons, the Birmingham Barons. Michael Jordan. That's funny. Willie Mays. It is Willie Mays. <laughs> Could you imagine Willie Mays and Ted Williams in a lineup? That's crazy. That is crazy. But they didn't sign him like for some reason. Like it, it was inexcusable, I guess. All right, Dom, true or false? Dominic DiMaggio, Johnny Pesky, and Dick Flavin. That crew. Bobby Dewar stayed back with his wife. Um, never turned on the radio during the three-day road trip from northeast coast down to Florida. True. It is true. They had so much to talk about that the radio never went on. That is unbelievable for that amount of a car ride. So that is kind of the gist. We got some background. What I want to do now is move to the second draft reading. And I, and I want you to be patient with us because it's worth it. Um, I want to paint a portrait of friendship by going and painting a portrait of each of these players. So you get to know them. And by doing this, I want you to see what each person brought to the, brought to the table and how that contributed to the friendship. So Jake, I'm going to read one and then you can tell me what you think about the player. Just keep going. And as soon as we get through all the players, we're going to get to how did these four friends stay together for a lifetime? and a couple of debatable topics about friendship along the way. All right? So let's start off with our good, we're gonna go in, we'll, we'll save Ted Williams for last because he seems to be even more famous of them, okay? Now, how familiar, Jake, are you with Bobby Dewar, Dom DiMaggio, and Johnny Pesky, for instance? Um, I mean, Johnny Pesky's Pesky's pole, right? The Correct. right field lineup, Fenway. Uh, for a man who hit less than 20 home runs, I think it's kind of funny that he has a Follow pole, player pole named after him. Yep. Um, I, Don DiMaggio was probably more well known um, just for his last name than than anything else, which isn't fair. He's a good ball player. Uh, and not a whole lot about Bobby Dewar. Okay. Not a whole lot. I wouldn't imagine. So, and and I don't mean that in a degrading way at all. What I mean is, is that the reason why we're saying these traits is because you're going to learn a lot about them in a very short amount of time and what i want you, any listener to do is which character do you relate to the most maybe i'll p pass that to you jake you know which conglomeration of of these players did you represent in friendship or as a teammate and w when you look at somebody's stat line because i got people's stat lines here you sometimes miss this so if you're looking at stat cast or fan graphs or whatever mlb saber metrics you will we sometimes forget that they're people and this is a, a key distinction of that. So let's start off with Bobby Dewar. I'm going to read fast. So I need you to listen fast, not you, but the audience and hang with me. Okay. Cause I'm just going to smother you with characteristics of these, of these, of these players. The first one is Bobby Dewar. He was a second baseman for the Boston Red Sox at 5'11, 175 pounds out of Los Angeles, California. He was quiet, a quiet man, introverted, more mature than Ted Williams. 
uncommon emotional equilibrium. He never got angry or down. He was calm, which was needed by Ted Williams. He never swore, which will be funny when we get to Ted. He was secure within himself. The road for him was always straight and smooth. Few people could connect Ted's swing when it was out of sync. Ted wouldn't listen to anybody, but he would listen to Bobby Dewar. They had the 60-year debate about hitting, so he was more or less a patient punching bag. He was trusted and firm. A fisherman with Ted Williams. We're going to get to that. They love the solitude and the escape. He had unconditional love for Ted Williams. He knew all of his faults and loved him just the same. Confident, always the person, he was a confidant, always someone you could turn to, an ambassador for Ted Williams. So when he got angry and grumpy, you know, Bobby would be the one to say, hey, he doesn't mean that. Like he just, Ted being Ted. He was the nicest, most balanced man you ever met, according to the author. And that wasn't the only person who said that. They said, yep, I met Bobby Dewar. When I first went to the Red Sox, I met Bobby and he was already an established star. I was a kid and I thought he was about the nicest teammate a person could ever have. And now more than 50 years later, I've thought more and I know more about the world. And I've decided that Bobby Dewar is just about the nicest person I've ever met. According to, Bob, uh, who was that? Mel Parno. He was a straight, old fashioned, or what we call a square. Graceful and modest, respectful. His priorities never dis never were distorted. Everything Ted Williams wanted to be and loved to be, but never could be. Unnatural, instinctive, graceful, deeply loved his wife. He was faithful to the end. I asked Chat GPT what would be a good mascot for Bobby Dewar. And it would have been the Stanford Cardinals, like the oak tree. I don't think uh, Stanford is an oak tree. So he was wise and steady like an oak tree. Mm -hmm. And the author said that if he had a job, he would have been a small, small town college dean, popular with everybody. So that is the portrait of Bobby Dewar. So let's, let's play this, Jake. How, how much do you relate one to 10 to Bobby Dewar? Any, anything stand out to you? I mean, I would say nine or 10. I'd say nine or 10. Um, I think the tree is is very interesting, the way that it connects with him, um, just kind of being this solid, unmovable, always reliable friend. Yeah, I think that comparison's spot on with everything that you said about him. Um, kudos to Chat GPT. Uh, I think, and then what you were describing, the word that came to mind was rock. That's probably the word in my vernacular that that pops in. He was a rock. And we're going to get we're going to get to that because I have a question for you later about how valuable was Bobby Dewar to Ted Williams? Like when you think of like a GM perspective and I'll, t I'll give you the context of that in a bit. But being that rock, excuse me. How do you quantify that? This is one thing that I think wouldn't understood. Like when we talk about industry, I get that. But when you get to that third one, like, what do I pick third? This matters. So, like, I'm on the team that friendship does matter. Teammates do matter. And I think this is one element that's very much missing at the college. Mm -hmm. Not as much, but at the pro level. Mm -hmm. We need friendship. Like, there is something to be said of that legacy of friendship. So, mm -hmm. I agree with that. I didn't mean to cut you off. Rock is no, good. You're good. You're good. Continue. Continue. Number two, anything else? On, wait, anything else on Bobby Dewar? You know, I'm curious who's going to be the quote unquote mom or quote unquote dad of the group. And so far, Bobby Dewar is the leader of the clubhouse. But I'm not sure he's going to get passed up. Okay. I'm, I, I like your angle there. Let's see when we get to the end. Number two is Dom or Dominic Paul DiMaggio. Throws right, bats right. He was the center fielder uh, for the Boston Red Sox for the long, long time. Height 5'9", 168 pounds from San Francisco, California. And what you need to know about Dom DiMaggio is that he was respected as a player and a man. And here's why. He was intelligent, serious, and well-liked by his teammates. He was very independent, so he was willing to disagree with Ted Williams. And he's like, hey, you don't really think that, do you, Dom? He's like, no, I don't. Why do you say that? Because I can see it all over your face kind of thing. Um, he was more complete, a more complete and sex, 
successful human being. Yeah, I know. Then Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio. So outside of baseball. So as much as he wasn't as good a player, he succeeded in the professional realm after. He was a man of means, graceful, elegant, and wise. He was small and wore glasses. I'm going to show you these pictures after this too. He examined everything carefully max to maximize his chances and athletic abilities. He was always succeeded by overcoming adversity. Nothing ever came easy to him. He struggled against all odds. He looked like the assistant professor of biology, according to someone. <laughs> he had, though, talent, passion, and purpose. He was intense. Nothing was ever wasted. Pitchers loved him because he was so good and covered so much ground, so he was speedy. He was observant and studied the game and life. He spoke carefully, spoke thoughtfully, and he never had any braggadocio. He developed uh, pagets or pa I don't know how to say it, P-A-G-E-T, a disease. So this breakdown of bones and it just things where he became very hunched over. Really struggled with that. Uh, Joe DiMaggio was his older brother. So he lived in that shadow. He really let people come to him, though, and let his talent speak for himself. He believed to have respect before intimacy. And he was also faithful to the end. Um, the author described him as a CEO if he would have a job. And the mascot from ChatGPT was an owl. He was wise, reserved. Rice University would have been his college mm. for the owls. Any thoughts or number for Dom DiMaggio? Yeah, I guess there's there's plenty there that I connect with. Unexpected, honestly. I That's not what I would have expected him to be described as. Mm -mm. Obviously, I knew very, very little about him. Um, you know, most of it's probably because of his older brother that mm -hmm. things get associated with him. And an owl is not one thing that I would have associated with him. I think, I think my favorite part of this is the, the mascot, quite frankly, and what that speaks because it it creates a whole nother level of connection in your head with the person, correct? And and there's so, like, in like a Tim Ferriss book, I think it was Tribe of T Tools of Titans, don't quote me, he did like a spirit animal for each person. And in English, when we taught this, we would do a character chart and they set a symbol for each character. And so when I taught, we would have debates over, okay, what would be the symbol for this person based on these traits? I did it with chat GPT for the, for the fun of it. And it's just fun to play around, but it does give you a picture. So we have a tree, we have an owl and we're going to get to the end of like, okay, what does that mean? Like, what do we see here? Um, and this is why we study this, right? Cause we have two now very different people. I would say that Dewar and DiMaggio have a lot in common. I would agree. You know, um, Bobby Dewar was a natural. Everything kind of more or less came easy to him as an athlete, whereas Dewar or DiMaggio did not, which is hilarious because Joe was so good, right? Yep. So fluid and so great. So they, to have his younger brother be the opposite of him mm -hmm. just blows my mind. Yep. So what would you score? How close are you to, to DiMaggio? Dom DiMaggio. I'd say eight. Okay. Let's move on. We're going to keep moving, but we're developing our portraits. The next athlete or our next teammate is Johnny Pesky. And in the back of the book, Johnny Pesky, his, he actually was not Pesky. His name was much longer than that. Paveskovic, John Michael Paveskovic, and they shortened it up. We have to remember a lot of these athletes were first-generation kids of migrants or immigrants. And so there's a lot of talk of that in the book. But he was 5'9", 168 pounds, very similar. Bats left, throws right, played infield, mostly third and short to uh, Bobby Dewar's, um, or yeah, Bobby Dewar's second base. Um, and what we learned about him is he would have been a great college baseball coach. He would have been a legend on the team that always won. Um, but what did we learn about Johnny Pesky? He was loyal. He was with the Red Sox for 60 plus years, right? Probably to a fault, if I would give him that. He was consistent. And that's going to come up twice with the two cigars a day. He was the most combative and likely to get into a fight of the four teammates because he was the smallest. So he had a little Napoleon complex, which I think is funny. He was actually better. He ended up coaching a little bit. He was better in the minors than with veterans because he liked the development and getting to know the kids. But he was too nice of a man to manage at the top is what was said of him. He remained a boy in spite of it all. He remained utterly unchanged, a kid living a dream. So he had that boyishness or ch child likeness. 
He was kind, caring, almost innocent. He was consistent. He had 60 years with the Red Sox, breakfast with the same group of men for decades, um, on and on and on about that, where he just was had his people and he was around them all the time. He was a friend to multiple generations, players, writers, trainers, fans. Like he was the pillar or a pillar in Red Sox lore. Mm -hmm. Just that, I mean, equated to whatever player in, in your favorite team. He was the most enduring member of the group, enduring and endearing. He was faithful till the end, also to Ted. He had a very, very grateful heart and appreciative of everything that baseball and his friends gave him. He just couldn't believe that he was so lucky. And a quote at the end of the book to illuminate that, he said, um, the author said, Pesky was in no way disappointed with what had not taken place during the rest of his life. Instead, he seemed somewhat in awe of how long it had all lasted, how rich his life had been, and how many friends he had made, how many people actually liked him, and how many people still remembered him in his glory days and were pleased to be in his company. It was never about money. The money was okay, less surely than it should have been because of the labor laws, but he was very happy with that. The, the mascot from ChatGVT was the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC Retrievers. So they equated him to a golden oh. or a Labrador retriever. Any Thank thoughts you. on Johnny Pesky? I didn't realize how big of a figure Johnny Pesky was to the Red Sox. I'll admit, I'm, I'm in Minnesota, okay? So I don't know everything about the Red Sox. But he is like the organizational pillar of that. He's got a, he's got a pole named after him, for goodness sakes. I get that. But still. I'm just trying to picture when he came up to bat the first time in Fenway. It was like the PA guy, like, no, 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 batting, 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 or the Red Sox, 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 Sox. Johnny Pavesku, excuse. No, Johnny he Pavesku. Somebody shortened it. Johnny Pesky. Yeah. Johnny Pesky's up. <laughs> yeah, that's stuck. I'd be curious how they came up. With that. Anyways, um, I think so. Kind of what he's telling me is you kind of lay out these people and who they are and, and whoever. when we get to the mascot it seems like it pulls the strongest character out of them so when you tell me retriever loyalty yep when you tell me owl you tell me intelligence mm -hmm. when you tell me tree you're telling me reliable or solid mm -hmm. so that's kind of what i'm keeping in my mind here as you go through these and I'm really curious what this last one's going to be and how they're all interacting with each other. It's it's a world. And remember, all these are debatable. And that's one that's really interesting is how would you characterize your friends? What traits do they have that you admire? And so on and so forth. Um, what's your score out of 10 for Pesky? Seven. Interesting evaluation. This would be a great exercise. All right. Now, next and last, and we'll move forward to our questions and how these four state friends, and I'll show you pictures of these guys, um, is the famed Ted Williams. Okay. Probably the most tragic of the here of the four, tragic hero. Um, and all right, but he was born Theodore Samuel Williams, bats left, throws right, six three, two hundred and five pounds from Inverness, Florida. Um, he was described as a broom holding a bat at 6'3", 147 pounds. The first of the power hitters to really develop torque because he was so small. But I want you to hear the, and I didn't put these in any positive, negative order, the contrast. I like that they're kind of random as they, because I did them chronologically. So he had a passion for excellence. He was belligerently intelligent. He was a force of personality. Never lost an argument. The joke was that, you know, Joe DiMaggio may have had a 56 game hitting streak, but Ted Williams had 33,277 arguments he never lost. <laughs> he was the undisputed champion of contentiousness, but he was also the glue that kept the, the four together. He had uncontrollable volatility, meteoric mood swings. He was more open as a person than DiMaggio, Joe DiMaggio. He was the most blasphemous player of all time. The road for him was full of bends and always rough in comparison to the other three. 
Dewar described his relationship with Williams as tempestuous. He was a perfectionist and a purist to a fault so that there was a wrong way to do things and meaning that it wasn't Ted's way to do things so that it was so bad that you could get into his boat wrong. You could cut up grapefruit wrong. You could hit wrong. Everything. It was a possibility for him. Like, you know, whatever the, he was also the hardest on himself first. He was, he had a joyousness and zest for life that had just sheer animal energy. He was insecure and impatient. He really was just a sad little boy and a tragic hero. We'll see here why. He had what's called pure power. They called him a star because he willed them to stay close. He was generous, meaning he gave more than he took. He was his own worst enemy, meaning that if there was no obstacle, he made an obstacle or bumps in the road for himself. He just couldn't not have chaos in his life, essentially. He was always his own man. He remembered everything about baseball, pitchers, situations, you name it. He was totally wired, uh, nervous, and animated. He was noisy without knowing he was being noisy, and he was the loudest rookie in history when, at a time when rookies should be quiet. Um, he wanted, this is a, one of the coolest sentences I've ever heard about Ted Williams. He wanted to be the best, be, uh, best ever, and he was scared to death he wouldn't be. There was nobody more blank, meaning... He lived at the extremes of emotions and personality. There's nobody more generous, nobody more volatile, nobody more ener and you know enthusiastic, nobody more this. He lived on the edges. He was unchangeable, true to himself. He was a fighter. Everything with him was a fight of honor and personal integrity, even down to the minutest detail. He has a lot in common with MJ. It's kind of unreal. He hated failure, and that made him sensitive. Um, his great truth that he was was that he was going to be great. His great secret is that he was trying to escape his home, his home life. His acts of kindness came from the shame of his background, where his dad was basically absent and his mom was proselytizing for the Salvation Army. And he, what was best, another way, another good sentence for him, he's, he's professionally dominant, but relationally turbulent. His kids didn't like him. He went through multiple marriages. He's basically a, the stubborn SOB that was really hard to get along with. It was Ted being Ted and you had to take him or leave him as he was more or less. He did have quite a tragic home life and upbringing and his family was a recollection of that when they asked for money and their mom was just asking for money to give to his brother who was up to no good. And he would crumple up the letters and send them, throw them in the trash, you know? So he had a very, other side of him that maybe you didn't see that these three teammates did get to see the the mascot for this was uw green bay the phoenix because he rose more or less from the ashes from a very very difficult upbringing to succeed and then he burned is equally on the other end in other areas of his life. The author said that if he was in a career, he would have been a brilliant brain surgeon had he not been a baseball player. <laughs> so that is the portrait. Now, before, let's finish finish you off. So what, what do you think of Ted Williams, the Phoenix, and how much do you relate to this more or less very, like I said, tragic hero um, of a person two, and player? Two, don't That's relate you. to him very much at all. Uh, can't imagine someone being that volatile, being a brain surgeon, which kind of concerned me a little bit. Probably had the bad side, bad side manners of one. Yeah, right. He Sorry, seems, brain surgeons. <laughs> he seems the other three, for the most part, came across as very steady and stable, and he seems to balance that out all in one person, like balance the three of them. And their steadiness with his non-steadiness, his all over the map uh, life and approach. You know, I this is more the person, the individual. I'd be curious what the other others' upbringings were like, how stable they were, um, how non-challenging they were, or possibly how challenging they were, because I'd like to know how much of his personality and everything that was articulated there was from the trauma of his upbringing. So I, I left that out 
because that would be for a whole segment because it didn't have to do with friendship. I can answer that question um, very, very quickly. So doer, um, most of these guys came up through immigrants, you know, out, out west. Dewar had very solid parents. Both of his parents really loved him, cared for him. He came from a very stable background. Johnny Pesky also had immigrant parents who invested in him, gave him roots. But the rule in their house was that you had to work hard for what you had. They couldn't believe that you could make money playing baseball. Mm -hmm. Joe DiMaggio, um, I think they're Italian. You know, they they were also immigrant family. You know, multiple kids who had done well. Same kind of idea. A, a strong work ethic. You know, they. You know, once they saw his brothers playing, because they had another brother that played professionally, they kind of saw him going up there. Um, but they had a lot more stability. And, and Ted Williams, and I, I couldn't find the page, but I did underline it, told Bobby Dewar at one point, you don't know how lucky you had it to have parents like that and how much he wished he had that. And um, I think that's uh, that was a part of their recipe as well. And you'll yep. see that when we get to the shame section and the things they carried um, at the end of these next questions. It just brings to mind, when we talk personality, how much are we talking what God made you to be versus mm -hmm. how much are we talking what your surroundings made you to be and what truly is your personality and how we define it? It's very, very interesting. It's a very I interesting topic and, and all that goes around it and how everything plays together that's what popped in my mind is you're telling me such a polar opposite of the other three and how we had a tough upbringing and now you're telling me that the other three were much more solid although i do chuckle at the peskies because can you imagine getting on a boat coming to this brand new country with this this i mean i guess i don't know how old johnny was maybe he wasn't born yet whatever but you have this kid in this new country and you know you're from probably a very agricultural society having to be very dependent on what you can produce and everything and you get to this place and someone tells you oh yeah your son can make more money than you ever made playing this game that you've never seen before yep that's crazy to me that's gotta be a crazy experience yeah it's hard to believe to be honest and that that, that came up in their contracts and like how much money they got made because they showed promise you know as kind of playing for their their legion or town ball teams and things like that um very, very interesting. I, I want to show you the pictures, though, because I, I thought about leaving them up while we talked about them, but I wanted to get your own image in your head and then mm -hmm. reveal what they look like as we go here. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I don't own any of these photos, but, you know, they're open up and up there. So let's go in order. Can you see this, Jake? Yep. Okay, so we got Ted Williams and Bobby Dewar. And it's funny because I, I you can see how much of a beanpole Ted Williams is, Bobby Dewar. Um, and then kind of having that laughter about hitting, I can just imagine that conversation going through. Um, gotta love the jerseys. Holy cow. That dates mm -hmm. the era. Mm -hmm. um, then we move to our friend Dom, oop, Dom DiMaggio. So there's our assistant professor of biology, if there ever was one. No kidding. Um, but, and he needed the glasses. He could not see worth a lick. And at that time, he was four eyes. You know, he got made fun of for it. But it turns out he was a heck of a player. And then this is him with his with his brother and Ted. And you can just see that brotherly resemblance. Just uncanny, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, super cool. Then we get the I picked this photo because it looked like that boyishness, like that just kid like energy. Cause he doesn't look young here. Right. Um, you can just see how he would be enduring and loving and you know, all all the above. Johnny Pesky. And then lastly, here's all four. You know, so you get Ted Williams, you know, kind of the icon, and then the other three um, throughout. And um, I don't know how many pictures we have of this in sports. Like, how many pictures do we really have of not only great players, but that maintain to be – maybe we do, and I just need to dig into more current examples. I would love to know if anybody's got a more current example of people who have since retired and yet have remained friends like this. That would be really cool to hear. I'd love a book about that too. Do you know how long they played together? Uh, a better part of a decade, uh, maybe six to 10 years. That's a good question. I would, you're stumping me. It wasn't explicitly said. I think it would be in the back of the book because they have like how their team standings were. But it was a while because they came up together too. I remember mm -hmm. when they first played together. 
it looks like it doesn't say when they were it just says the red sox team standings from 37 to 53 but that'd be a good question i'm not sure i would bet it's over five years but under 10 if you made me pick well, at least ted williams is just looking it looks like ted williams and bobby Durer played from 39 to 51 together yep and that was when starting that is starting because Ted Williams started in 39 and it's ending because Bobby Dewar stopped playing in 1951. Yep. Okay. So that is the portrait that you see. And, and I, what I was hoping I told Jake this before we recorded is I really wanted to show the humanity of these athletes. And I think we forget that sometimes when we get so zoned into the mechanics of the game, the winning, the losing, the, the fight that we forget all of the attributes that we bring, whether it was nature, nurture, as you said, that we put in together on a team, you know, I mean, there's this, this magic that can sometimes happen between teammates, between teams in general. Um, I think we forget and looking at that we're coming in as, as very strong and flawed people at the same time. And how do those things interact and how do we serve and help each other going forward? So the, the real big question here, Jake is, how did these four friends stay together for a lifetime? So I, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you four concepts and I'm going to ask you to pick and preach. So we're going to kind of test out a new thing where I'm going to throw some things at Jake and he can pick and preach what he likes of them. Um, so these are some of the bigger principles that popped out about friendship um, that I saw. And then we'll get into some debate topics. So number one is there got to be glue. So Ted Williams was the question is who's the glue on your teammates or your friendship there's got to be somebody on your team that is the glue and on in the beginning of the book it says so on page 14 and 15 of the soft cover edition is that they all knew they knew as well as that one of the reasons they had all stayed friends was because of ted that he is the most compelling personality among them not just the best person uh ball player he was the most dominating personality both generous and combative in the same instant, ever tempestuous, the man-child who dominated every conversation, who shouted others down, who never lost a single argument to anyone. And that is something that's interesting. So one concept is there needs to be somebody who's the glue. It doesn't have to be the dominant personality. It could be the funniest person. It could be the director, could be whatever. You need somebody to be the glue, whether your group is two of you, three of you, four of you, 10 of you. So that's one thing. Number two is get some nicknames, people. So each of these guys had nicknames. So uh, Teddy or Ted Williams was Teddy Ballgame, the kid. Um, we had Johnny Pesky um, was Needle Nose. Um, Bobby Dewar, what was his nickname? He had, they had one for him too. Um, uh, Dom was just Dommy or Dom. Let me see if I can find our friend Bobby Dewar. 16, 17. Um, I don't think they have one for da uh, Bobby Dewar. It didn't say. I would have wrote it down. Um, but they had nicknames for mostly everybody. They even had nicknames for their wives. So one of their wives was called the Queen. And that's what Ted Williams called her because she was royalty, and they just she just loved him. Or according loved to her. yeah, according to Google, Bobby uh, Bobby Dewar's nickname was Silent Captain. Silent Captain. Oh, see there we go. Thank you, <laughs> Internet. Um, but the point is when you do develop a relationship and you have nicknames for each other, even if it's just shorthand, um, and not every friendship needs nicknames to be sure, but, um, that's something really interesting. The third one is checking in frequently. So calls, this became a big deal when we did the episode on the good life, but I want to tell you that when Joe DiMaggio's health began to fail, Dominic DiMaggio got deeply involved in trying to take care of his brother. It was at that point that Ted began to call Dominic five or six times a week. At the end of the book, which we're going to keep the tears to a minimum here, or try, we'll save it for the end, Dom would call Ted every day by phone, and they would talk mostly about the Red Sox, and sometimes Ted would nod off, um, and so forth. And Dom would say, Teddy, are you there? And Ted would say, yes, I'm here, Dommy, I'm here. And sometimes there'd be no answer at all. So they called each other frequently. So friends stay in touch is the point. And the last one is, is find the money, Manusha's money. So finding the money in a relationship. So 
this came as actually advice from a coach, Heine Manoush. There's a name. A great hitter <laughs> himself with 17 years in the big leagues was uh, Johnny Pesky's manager when he was in um, the Pacific Coast League. A career 330 batting average. There you go. Heine Manoush. Manoush, then 37 years old, was John Thought, a wonderful man, the perfect teacher for a young, eager baseball player. Um, he was a role model of kindness and tolerance. Okay, But Manoush gave him the most crucial advice. And I think this was, I wrote, this was money for friendship. He said, accept who you are, maximize your strengths, minimize your weaknesses. If you don't have size, don't try and fake it and play like your power hitter. John, he said, don't try and be what you're not. And then later in the book, we have this last piece about strengths and weaknesses or Manoush's money on page 108, 109. As I flip, where we talked about Ted Williams, it says you had to accept him like that with all the pluses and minuses that came with it. When he was generous, there was no one more generous. And when he was petulant, there was no one more petulant. And sometimes he was both within a few seconds. So four concepts, pick and preach, Jake. There's got to be glue. Get some nicknames, check in frequently, and find the money, as in um, find what's good. What do you, What stands out to you about those four principles of these four teammates' friendships? Well, you said find the money, and then you start talking about be who you are. Don't be anyone you're not. Yep. So I think that's the most important human trait that a any human can have. You need to know thyself. You need to know who you are and what you excel at, what you can bring, and then you can play to those strengths, both as a friend, as an employee, as a player, knowing who you are. And sadly, I think we've gotten to a point where um, knowing who you are, especially from a coach's perspective of coaching the kids where they're at, um, now gets viewed as limiting them. Okay. So if you're a 10% three-point shooter and your coach tells you not to shoot threes, well, you're limiting the kid. He could be he could be making more threes if you let him shoot more. But yet, no, that's that's not the case. He, he, he builds a brand new gym every time he shoots a three. So can we not do that anymore? Right? We're trying to get someone playing to their strength, and it's viewed as limiting. I think there's an issue there in society how that's changed. I think it's so key, okay? The player's going to grow in confidence. He's actually going to grow in ability when you focus them on what they do well yeah. and try to put them in a place where they can do what they do well more and more and more and more and more, okay? So that's my first thing I want to say. Yep. Back to the glue part. I think that's fascinating. Uh, I think... I, th I, it seems like Ted Williams is much more the flamboyant glue guy who's going in and bringing together, bringing together people outside of the specific group. So we're talking about these four guys. Well, that wasn't the entire Red Sox team, right? There were more guys on that team. And if I if I had to guess, I'm sure Ted was the guy that was making those all the branches, that was making those connections to the guys outside of that group. If you want to know why that group was so close, those four specifically. I'm going to guess it was probably much more Bobby Dewar being that silent glue behind the scenes, keeping them together, just based on the descriptions that you've you've offered. Mm -hmm. But how important it is that you need both, and the challenge that that can be as a youth coach, as a youth player, when you are playing, you're playing with a team, or you're trying to bring a team together that's from what three or four different schools. I've been there. Two or three kids are hanging out all the time because they go to school together. So like, there's that natural connection. You get it. But then you've got three or four schools there that you're all trying to bring together. And the importance of finding the person that can be the olive branch between those groups and then putting them in a position to do it, whether that's leading them in some sort of activity like a warm-up, whether that's naming them a captain, whatever that may be, but trying to pull that, first finding that person and then putting them in a position to to grab all those people and bring that stretch that glue further right across more people yep and then if you're it, a player recognize that if 
even if maybe that's not your natural, and I know we talked about being yourself, right? But you don't have to be outside yourself, just small things of trying to notice, hey, is this team clicky? Hey, is these groups, whatever. And then trying to be that olive branch. Yeah. Right. Trying to mix, mix up the, the groups or the partnerships when you, when you split off into teams or doing activities is important. Yeah. The, I mean, if somebody, sometimes our strengths are invisible in that glue concept, you don't always know that though. this is just what I do. But the coach and everybody else can see, like, hey, everybody touches the sticky to, like, in a good way, right? Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. And so these four things are are, are, are very helpful. Um, and I want to give you some more. So these are the three. Again, pick and preach of these three. So the fifth one here is go beyond the game. And this is what we have called primary and secondary friendship. So... This one is with Bobby Dewar and Ted Williams. I really don't even need to look it up. They, yes, play baseball together. You know what else they did? They fished together. So I think that's something as a friendship, like you can just be friends at your sport. Like, yeah, we're friends when we play. But then there's like, you have that thing outside of it too. And it could be just as simple as you hang out, you play video games, you just, but you have something else. So that's another key component of their friendship is they went beyond the game and had another reason to get together besides their sport. Because their sport might not be there forever. But fishing might be. <laughs> so what might your fishing be? Uh, the sixth one is identify your confidant. Now, you have a picture of Ted Williams now, right? And he battled reporters. He battled everybody, right? And Bobby was the one guy, after a rough game or a rough time with the reporters, that Ted would ask to go for a walk. Remember, he was the ambassador for Ted. And I do want to read this one on page 71. And my question is, how valuable was Bobby Dewar um, to this? But he was the one person you can always turn to. Um, later, when they were both on the Red Sox and Williams struggled to deal with fans and the media, and on occasion with some of his older teammates, he and Dewar would often arrive in the city by train and check into the hotel together. Williams, restless and edgy, always high strung from the pressures that went with being a superstar from the additional pressures to excel that he put on himself and doer guest from the nature of his emotional wiring would want to go for a walk, but only with doer. And that was something that I saw come up. And then the ambas ambassador quote was this back then, Bobby doer was not just his closest friend. This is a big deal. It's helpful. If your superstar as a friend, he was a kind of ambassador for Ted for the rest of the world, explaining him, pointing out that he Ted meant no harm and that yes he really was likable there was no meanness there the noise was uh was just more bluster than anything else that's what best friends were for after all and doer was perfectly cast for the role of young ted williams best friend so identifying your confidant is the point of that one and the last one for pick uh pick and breach is carry the burdens and carry the shame and this one's this one's hard um, because it gets into our some of our other things, but I think one thing that we see out of all three of these friends is the contrast of Ted Williams, like how wonderful he is in one arena and how scarred and hurt he is in another. And I told you that he was always um his secret truth was that he needed to be great in order to escape his terrible home life, and that he was always fighting the shame about his background. And for a long time, the acts of kindness he displayed were seen as a reflection of the trauma, pover poverty, and dysfunction of his boyhood home. And they go on to say that his secret shame about his family was like a jigsaw puzzle. And they talk about his brother, who was nothing more than a punk who just asked for money. Ted saying, you don't know how lucky you are, Bobby. You just don't know how lucky. You've got the greatest parents. Your dad is always watching out for you. And so we see that he had the shame and pain of a broken home, and he hated all of it so much. As, as we were walking around, they said he was letting us into his boyhood home. So they did go back to his boyhood home. He showed it to him. I was thinking to myself, this is where it all started. I'll never forget the day when he took us all around because you could feel, all you could feel was the sadness of it. The sadness of that little boy and the sense that it had weighed on him so heavily for so long. I don't think I ever realized, Dewar said, how deep the scar was until 1961 almost 25 years after we first met and he um you could see see that out of him so um kind of the concept of you can see the things they carried where it all started 
And um, that's kind of the point of that good life episode is like being able to carry one's burdens for each other. And I could easily see how Todd Williams would have self-destructed had he not had these three in his life in some capacity. Could you imagine the depression and the loneliness had these guys not been calling him constantly as his health failed? So, mm-hmm. so go beyond the, the game, uh, identify your confidant and carrying burdens, carrying the shame, uh, pick and preach. Jake, what do you like? <clears throat> carrying the shame, I think is, is phenomenal. I think that's something that as humans develop, it's something that they need to be able to do is to be vulnerable with one another. It's probably a little bit more mature of a topic than, than what we're going after. Um, <laughs> Isolating your superstar. I, I think the role of Bobby Doerr in this is, I don't know that you can put a price on it. A team can fall apart really fast when there's no one that can connect on the team with the superstar. Mm-hmm. And there's no way then for the superstar connect, to connect with the team. To have that go between is so vital because it brings the superstar back down to like human level. Uh, with the team through a person, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it brings the rest of the team up to their level. When you isolate a superstar, the levels happen, right? It's very much like boom and boom. Well, let's let's give you an example of this. And I and I've loved this player and I know who he is as a person. He reminds me a lot of Ted Williams. Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds was the situation in San Francisco, if you read into it. And there's truth and and lies there. So it's probably not as all as it seems, but there's a kernel. Barry Bonds was a player without a Bobby Doerr. Mm -hmm. And you saw the results of that. And I mean that as a player during his career and after his career. What would a Bonds have been like had he had a Bobby Bobby Doerr? I think that's kind of one more recent point case study of that uh, that we could see. And I agree with that. And I think that we sometimes forget um, you know, the David Rosses of the world, these glue guys that teams are trying to find Kyle Schwarber, you know, there, there are examples, Mike Redmond of the twins of all people, piranhas. Uh, yeah, yeah. Smell them. Um, we forget that just because their stats say one thing doesn't mean that they're bringing up the level of everybody around them. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't have a solid answer for that, but I do think it matters, especially when we talk about what lasts in athletics. And it doesn't just bring, and we say glue guy, it's not just bringing up the level of the superstar on the field. It's keeping them sane off of it so that they stay on the field. Yes. And I think this happens even at the youth level. It can happen even there, right? Things can be tur- turbulent at home. And as a kid, you don't know how to process that or what's actually going on. And so if you don't have someone there, that grounds that kid to the team and to what's happening in front of them. It's very easy for them to develop a me first personality. And I think that's what sticks out about Ted Williams. It's not that he didn't have an ego or that he didn't think of himself highly, but his friend group kept him connected to earth. Yeah. (laughs) You know, when you hear comments like, you know, Bobby, you don't know how good you had it. That's keeping him connected to the real world. Like, sure, Ted Williams, you can play baseball at a level no one's seen before. But before you go thinking you're all that in a bag of chips, right, it, it, it's a sobering thought, but it reminded him of what he didn't have and kept him hungry and I think in a way kept him humble. That was just as important as anything else in his life. The most heartbreaking thing you read about Ted Williams in this, uh, other than his childhood background, was when he would call Dom DiMaggio and say, Dom, I've made such a mess of my life. You know, I got this, I got that. And he saw how Dom turned out with his business and his family and this and that. And Dom would have to talk him back. He's like, dude, you're an American hero. You're Ted Williams, for goodness sakes. Like, you know, look at how much you've inspired so many people. You served in two wars. You did... You know, you've given back. So, like, you know, he was able to speak some life into him, even though he was probably, Ted was probably right that, you know, yes. But I agree with being grounded. That is such a big thing. 
you know i mean i i look at i look at superstars now and we i use that term very openly and categorically and i have such a degree of sympathy for them you know what i mean like yes they're you know we envy the talent and the production and the you know the, the superstardom but at the same time as people god how, you know that's you know how, how, yes just it's so easy to go astray you know and lose yourself within yourself i'm grateful i don't have that burden <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think it also speaks to just society as a whole though and how it's changing is whether it be I don't, you know i think i can't put my finger on exactly but there's much more of uh those who are coming from humble beginnings tend to move toward an individualistic mindset saying that i can overcome this i will do it and just forget everything in the past that makes them human and they become disconnected from it and no one's there to pull them back to earth and then you get these superstars that become very meat oriented very individualistic mm -hmm. and it's them against the world period and i don't need anyone else there's definitely been a change in culture you know for ted williams to be to have that viewpoint on what he had in his upbringing that kept him humble it has seen there has been a flip in society now where those kinds of stories generate the opposite reaction in people of okay well then i guess it's me against the world and they shut off the people who may care most about them mm -hmm. and because you they the, the thing that makes them good is the thing that makes them bad you know what i mean like they just have to apply that over and over um because it's a winning formula right it works in this arena life so it has to work over here and it doesn't um and I see, and I see that. So I, we need people like Dewar and Dimaggio and Pesky in our lives. We need the childish, you know, childish wonder and awe and gratitude. We need the, you know, the groundedness and the wisdom and the tryhards that are the Dom Dimaggios. And I, I think that balances us out in the equation. Yeah, on the lighter, I just look at Dom Dimaggio and imagine that guy being a modern day athlete. He's Pedroia. We we're talking about no. Ortiz and Pedroia. A tryhard? No, I'm, sure. hard no, I'm just saying, look at his oh. picture and tell me that guy would would probably just summarily dismiss that appearance. Be like, yeah, no, that guy can't play. He needs and, to he was, and he was right. back then. Yeah, he was back then too. But what they couldn't see is all the other stuff that we read about him. So mm -hmm. I, I couldn't imagine that. I, I'm sure there are examples, but I agree with you. I agree with you. Cool. Well, let's move on to some of these other ones um, about friendship. Um, I just want to get your opinion on some of these that popped up, Jake. What do you think about friendship? And we have three more. And then we'll get to our most valuable idea, metaphor. And then I want to talk about the friendship dinner because I just think it's cool. Um, one thing get, people could start. So this next one is the hardest part about getting old. Three things were brought up after these guys got done playing. And we see it all the way through to Ted's death. Which do you think is one of the hardest parts of getting older? What are your thoughts on these three? So one is age, just that you get older, right? You know, we're in our thirties, you know, to imagine 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, Lord willing, we get there. Number two is illness. So you see Pesky gets allergic to wheat and he loses all this weight from like a buck 70, buck 80 down to 130. We see Dom DiMaggio getting Paget's disease. Ted Williams having multiple health issues, especially later in life. He was very vigorous up until his 80s. Um, we don't really learn too much about Dewar. His wife had health issues um, with multiple sclerosis. But the idea that age gets us and illness, number two gets us, is another one. Seeing your once vibrant friend confined to a wheelchair or emaciating in front of your own eyes or just suffering in general. Um, that's hard. And then the third one is geography. So that as you get older, you disperse and you just don't get to see each other. I think that's why the calls and the frequency were such a big deal. Um, and the previous principle is, is, is just checking in frequently. Um, mm -hmm. now they come from another generation where you just get on the phone and you call, you know, we can check in in a myriad number of ways. Um, but just that you do check in friends do make the call and they are always seeing how you're doing. Even if you just talk about Red Sox 
um, box scores, yeah. right? So it is a little bit of minutia and small talk, but it's true. <laughs> so what stands out to you about getting old? Because these friends navigate these three things quite well, and they have obviously strategies for that. But what what stands out to you about getting old through friendship, age, illness, and geography? Uh, geography would stand out the most, right? Life life takes over and you go your own way and it's really easily, it's really easy to get distracted by all the things that come up in life uh, that take priority. because they're right there in front of you, not a thousand miles away. You know, for me, top, as you get older, your perspective on time changes, which is both a blessing and a curse because you realize how valuable time is you realize how little of it you have left but then that knowledge weighs on you right like that that is a heavy burden to have knowing that you have short time i recently got together with some high school friends and <laughs> shortly after seeing them i being the sobering person that i am i was like all right guys here's the math let's say we live till we're 80 and the last time we saw each other was four years ago well if we keep up that pace we roughly have 10 more times 11 more times where we see each other and we usually see each other for two to three days mm -hmm. so that means at most we have 30 more days of this and one month left now i was going to save this for two more segments because i, I want to ask one thing but there is an article jake you are spot on i'm, I'm impressed you catch things that like because i I read other people and like you're just brilliant so i'm gonna give you that but it's called tail end by tim urban it's an article about the exact same thing where you only have so like the brutal math of it is like you really do only have x amount of days so tim urban i'll link it in in below i'll make a note of it right now tim urban has the tail end and he applies this to like relationships and he says parents spend upwards of like 80 90 percent of their time with their kids zero to 18 and after that you're in the tail end if your parents, Lord willing, that they are going to stay healthy up into a certain age, you're in the tail end the last four or five percent of that, right? In terms mm -hmm. of time and days, mm -hmm. you know, at, at this frequency, we're only going to see each other X amount of times. And Tim Urban does such a great job of visualizing this for you mm -hmm. and, and the gravity to savor those times and to overcome those barriers as well. Um, so what I was going to illuminate that was the tail end of friendship. So these guys, when they drove down there, they knew this was the last time they were going to see him. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get to that with the other point, but I agree with you. And, um, to that, bringing up that point is that there is a tail end of friendship. One of my favorite pictures is this meme or this quote about there was a last time you went out to play pickup basketball and none of you knew it. Mm -hmm. Right. I've seen that multiple times in different versions, baseball, basketball, whatever. Um, the last time. You know, and you don't think of that when you're a player, you're a kid. It's like, oh yeah, we just, you know, we're bored on a weekend. We're going to go play five on five for, you know, three or four hours. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't think of that. Um, so I, I, I hear you when you say you appreciate the, the gravity of time, the consequence of, of how valuable time is. Yeah. All right, next one. And we'll get to, it's going to be hard at the end, but do, this is a debatable topic, Jake. Maybe this is going to be our six year debate. Do teams need to be friends? Now I'm going to tell you the case here, here, this is our four teammates. They said that they were aware, these four were aware that they had been unusually lucky, my quotes, not just in the successful quality of their careers, that's rare, but also in the richness of their friendships they had made. So they, the author notes that because of salaries and, and free agency, how volatile rosters are now, and that they lessen the connection among teammates rather than solidify it. They and others who followed the sport, baseball in this case, realized there was less continuity and less community on teams. Of one Red Sox team, this is so harrowing, of the 70s, it had been said that when the team plane landed, the players quickly dispersed on their own. 25 players, 25 cabs. The final thing that goes with that is that towards the middle of the book, in contrast, is 108 and 109. In the middle. Um, 
maybe I have no idea why I put that down. Oh, I, I looked at the wrong one. Um, do team needs to be friends? Oh, it's page uh, 159. So it's towards the end. Excuse me, people. Thank you for your patience. Um, is that they liked each other, these four, right? They liked each other, and there was true joy, they believe, Bobby Dewar believed, in playing with men whom you liked and whom you trusted, especially when you had a great player like Ted, who so rarely would go on a prolonged slump. There was so much to be optimistic about at that stage. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you actually need to be friends between the lines? And it, whether in the short term or the long term or both, what do you think about this idea of being friends? I would say, no, you don't with a big asterisk. I think that talent can, can overcome a lack of friendship. I think the lasting more memorable experience is that yes, you are friends. I think in the long run, teams who are friends are better than a team who is not friends. I think that connection can make up for a lack of talent, um, a, a significant amount of difference in talent. Keep going. I'll be back. Yes, sir. Um, so I would say, I mean, yes, it's possible. Like, you don't need to be friends, but it's it's of the utmost importance. No, I take that back. It's a super valuable thing that gets way undervalued, especially now because people are, you know, oh, it's just a business. Sports is just a business. No, sports is a game. Sports is a game that you played among friends. Okay, it recently became a quote unquote business, and we recently became obsessed with getting every last million dollar that we could out of the game that we're playing. And it's tough because you can't argue with it, right? But yeah. I'm, I'm not going to argue with someone because they want two more million dollars in their contract. That's not chunk change. That's not a small thing. That makes a difference in that person's life. That's something that, you know, baseball players in that era just didn't have to deal with, right? They did have to deal with going to war, <laughs> sacrificing for their country. And I, I, mean, I don't know, did they see each other during the war at all? Like, I don't know. The author didn't say. Um, I think they were stationed in different places. So, no. Um, what, you know, as I stare at Wooden's Pyramid here, I got a little mini one that I look at. Wooden says, you know, friendship is strive to build a team filled with camaraderie and respect comrades in arms. Um, and I tried to stay away from how to build camaraderie and respect, like those types of books. I really wanted to get a picture of player coach, teammates, overall, why relationships matter. And we'll talk about how to build them in this last um, book on how to win friends and influence people. But as I think of Wood and like why he chose friendship next as a foundational piece, it, it is all the things we more or less said is that it's such a richer, you know, richer experience when we do have friends and we do get along. We don't, we don't have to be buddy buddies for a lifetime, but there is it does matter. And in terms of flow, the reason why group flow is more enticing than individual flow is you get more and better drugs. You get more of that feel good neurochemistry because it's an us thing. So yes, you know, when I think of the order, industrious enthusiasm, you got to have those like individually, but collectively we got to bring that together in this, these bonds. And that's where I think, you know, maybe Dom is right that you have respect for each other as people. You have respect for each other as players. Like if you're good, your talent speaks for yourself. And then you can move deeper into that friendship as you have things in common. I, I I think in the short term, I agree with you on the no asterisk. In the long term, I think you do. Like if you're going to have this lasting thing, it's a yes. I think it depends what do you need to be friends for. Mm -hmm. And I think the business of the game, it's a no. And the overall well-being, I, I, would, I would wager, I would love to make the case as a, flow coach or just as a person that teams should be considering this more mm -hmm. like when you have like a player who wants to play with another player or they're good friends from high school or college you know you see teams that have guys from the same school and their buddy i think that matters okay. I, I would be much more interested in what that chemistry would do for a team 
than if they didn't. You know, I mean, we just throw a, a conglomeration of a super team together. I think it matters. I think it should be more, a bigger variable. And it's not always possible to do this. Don't get me wrong. But as friends recruit friends, I think it matters. I, really do. I think it'd be interesting that if teams, instead of doing a wonder lip test when kids are coming out of the draft, if they did personality tests, yep. that would seem to me like it would make a heck of a lot more difference in trying to gather what kind of impact that person is going to have on your team and on the league and and whatnot. So, I, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think it's it's an undervalued part of sport right now. It seems to be much more of a lip service thing. Like, yeah, we put the team together. Oh, this team actually gets along. I was kind of surprised by that. Instead of a real concerted effort of getting the right personalities and the right types of people together to form a team. Again, we go back to knowing yourself. It's it's so key. I think it's such a vital role of, of putting together a team and assessing talent. But it gets skipped over. It does. Time. It does. And and what you bring to the team matters. Because Ted had all the things in the world. Like I admire the guy. Like, I mean, you just think of the sheer tenacity and like for he's like a force of nature. And I think those other three looked up to him. Obviously, he's better than him than them as a baseball player. But they, w- they wish they could be that outgoing. I'm sure Bobby Dewar, as square as he was, was like, I wish I could be that unabashed and blasphemous sometimes. You know, it's like almost it gave him freedom to like live through Ted and vice versa. Like, you know, they need each other. And um, I think everybody's trying to be something they're not sometimes. It's like, I want to be more Dewar, more Williams, more DiMaggio, more Pesky. Like, and if you're just not that, it just doesn't fit. And everybody can tell, yeah. except probably you. So. You know, and in the professional, I will say this: in the professional ranks, that becomes so much harder with the presence of media and the, the how the media happens these days. Back when these guys played, Porter would come, "Hey, you know, you went three for four today. How did it feel out there?" You give them a quote, right? But they weren't going on ESPN for two, three, four hours and commenting on, "Oh, Bobby Doers putting up some good numbers." But is he a Superman or is he, or is he a Batman or is he just a Robin? I think he might just be a Robin, right? And yeah. then all of a sudden the voices start to get like, oh, yeah, maybe I'm a guy that just plays second fiddle. And all of a sudden that ego starts to get, but you just can't help but get out of that. And it's just, it becomes this echo chamber that has to just drive people crazy. Oh, yeah. They didn't have to deal with. Yeah. You know? And now, especially, oh, my goodness, especially now, there's such a focus on legacy. Yeah. Who's going to have the best legacy? You know, I feel bad for someone like Kevin Durant pops into my mind with this. Yep. Okay, one NBA championship, been a part of some great things, but what's your what's your legacy, Kevin Durant? Is it as good as Michael? Is it as good as LeBron? Is it good as this feel? What do you feel for your legacy? And I think that's that's just something that no one else had to deal with. In yeah. That way. And I want to transition to that because you talk about legacy and does that last? And we'll we'll wrap up here this segment in the last couple is. I want people to be aware of friendship, like good friendship to to the end, kind of Captain America, Bucky, you know, I'm with you to the end kind of, yeah. it's going to be hard at the end. I, I don't know if we're just going to rip that bandaid off, but I want to illuminate that with these two, not Bobby Dewar, but Pesky and Dom and Dick Flavin, this reporter, drive down to Ted Williams. And I want you to see this and feel the words and know that it is going to be hard at the end. And at the tail end of friendship, I think they did it very well, is my assessment before I read it. They they went to the end, and they were friends until the end. They are faithful until the end. And I, you really can't ask for more than that. So I do want to illuminate that um, with a couple of patch, passages. So Dom DiMaggio uh, talked also about what it had been like dealing with his brother Joe in his final week. So he was a part of Ted's final weeks too. But he said it was hard. There are two occasions in Ted's final months when he turned to Dominic and asked plaintively, Dommy, why, why, why? Dominic knew what he meant. Why am I so sick? Why is this happening to me? And of course, what's next for me? Dominic would try as best as he could to explain these things that could never be explained. Teddy, we're all dealt a hand and we don't really understand the hand we've been given. None of us do. We do the best we can for all of our lives. The whole world is proud of the way you played, the hand you were given, and what you've done with your life. Dominic thought it was extremely painful to watch a man who had always been so physical and so powerful, and whose pleasures had come from the use of his body and his uncommon physical attributes, and who had been so independent because of those special gifts, now wither away and feel so frail and vulnerable and so dependent on others. 
moving forward, he said when they got there um, that they wheeled in Ted. The other two did not know what to expect, but Dom did. And when the attention, attendants wheeled Ted in, they gasped in shock. Here is their old friend, a man once supremely powerful, shrunken now down to a pa perhaps 130 pounds, head down on his chest. Um, you know, and one of the guys said he was about to have a heart attack. Um, he was trying to hold back tears. Flavin was numb, wondering if he should even be there at all. But here's what Dominic did. Okay. Raced across the room yelling, Teddy, Teddy, it's Dommy. Teddy, it's Dominic. And John is here too. And Dick Flavin. And then slowly Ted's head came up and he started to grin. They began to talk and Ted had asked Dom how the queen was, his wife, a reference to the much loved Emily. It was fascinating, they said, to watch Ted become stronger by the minute with the arri arrival of his friends. He had to take charge, of course, because that was the natural order of things, and that's what his friends want wanted. There were quizzes. Ted was dominating the three of them now, and he started doing quizzes with them. I'm thinking of a Yankee, guys. Initials, PT. A hell of a clutch hitter. Can you name him? Well, they all tried that one, but no one could get it. They all struck out, because finally Ted gave them the answer, which was Paul O'Neill. P-O, P-T? Hell, it was obvious that Ted had been right. Only Ted knew the answer, so he was right again. They visited him for two days, two visits a day, each one not too long, because he needed apps. They sang him a couple songs, and then it was time to go. Before he left, Dominic, this is friendship right here. I'm going to read the rest of this, and we'll be done. Before he left, Dominic asked Ted whether or not he was getting the baseball scores, you know, essential information. And apparently he was not. No one, he said, told him anything anymore. When the next season started, Dominic called him every morning with the latest Red Sox score and an update about how they were playing. If Dominic called a little late, Ted's attendants would tell him that Ted had been asking him about Dom and whether Dom had called yet. Then in the final weeks, Ted became weaker and weaker, and it was hard for Dominic to tell whether he was still there at the end of the line, because sometimes he would slip out of consciousness in the middle of the call. There had been one final call when Dominic had called in, and sensed the silence at the other end, and asked, Teddy, are you there? And Josh, Ted's attendant, had said, no, he's fallen asleep. Well, please tell him I called, Dominic said. And the next day, Ted died. So, friends till the end, and the lesson is, at the tail end of friendship, it's going to be hard. So whether it's age, illness, geography, all three, um, but I admire and respect seeing this come full circle, um, mm -hmm. the love that they had for each other in, in, in a way. So any, any thoughts? I know it's really heavy, but it was, I wanted to see how it ended. And that's one of the reasons why I picked this book is I wanted to see how it ended as much as I wanted to see the trajectory across time. Yeah, it's a morbid thought. And I think we've all, maybe we haven't. I guess it's one of those things where if you haven't, I would suggest doing it, but thinking about how it's going to end. You and your close friend group. I remember seeing my friends recently and you're leaving the airport you're just like i don't know when i'm going to see him again that was the first time in my life that i'd ever left him and been like i don't i don't know when the next time it's going to be and i have no guarantee it's going to be the same the next time i see him mm -hmm. so it's it's a morbid thought but i i think it's it is a healthy one because it puts it all into perspective and it keeps you in the moment even though you, you take a peek at the future to bring it back to the moment, to cherish the moment and appreciate the moment and how valuable that is to have that perspective. Um, but it's, yeah, it's something that I've thought about. What's it going to be like 60 years from now? What's, it, how's that going to look? <laughs> what are we going to be doing? Heaven forbid. And remember, if you're a player listening to this, I never thought of this stuff. This is why we're doing half of this. It's like, I didn't think of that. I did. I was so into me and the game and trying to be good and, whatever else was going on. You don't think of this stuff and neither do you as a coach. You're busy. You have your own family. You're running, you know, on two strings and you know, like, what do we say? What, how, how do you do all you do? I, I run on caffeine and flow states, you know, you don't have time to think of this, but that's the point is like, we need reminders of what lasts. And so I want to finish up with our most valuable idea and metaphor, and then give one challenge to everybody. Cause that that's an answer to you, Jake is, um, what's the most valuable idea from this? book. What do we learn about friendship and what lasts? And at the end of the book, the author said that um, the pleasure for these four had always been in the doing. 
the sheer delight in going out there every day and playing, be paying, being paid to do what you love to do. So one is like, yes, you, the industriousness, and the you do the thing you do together. That's great. Like that, there's, there's pleasure in that. And he goes on to say, and the richness, so the pleasure and the richness, the richness had come from the friendships, he said. How many people in other professions have friendships that last so long? Unusual friendships, because when you see each other, you were instantly taken back to another time when you were all young and some big game was on the line. Um, so I really got like, yep, the pleasure is like doing the stuff together. The richness is who you do it with, which is why I think wouldn't put that here. And um, I'm inspired from most of it. Like they all brought something and they all stuck with each other. That commitment. I just, I was blown away by that. Um, and how about you? You got a full picture of these four. Um, you got a good deep read. Any, anything valuable that lasts to you with this portrait of friendship? I think it's the richness in post, post season, right? Post after you get done playing, yeah. that there are memories that carry on for forever. Mm -hmm. And to have those memories and be able to share them, even when you're 90 years old, you can call the person up like, hey, remember that time in Yankee Stadium? <laughs> right. Remember that time when that, that bus when we, we had to drive three yeah. hours? Remember when we got stuck? All of those memories, all the things and the stuff that come along with that is, it makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. It makes Ted Williams pushing himself so hard and it, it being such a perfectionist worth it because he got to share it with somebody. He can look back like, yeah, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I got to experience that stuff with all those guys versus at the end of it, getting to it and be like, well, what was the point? Here I am. I have congested heart failure. I'm dying just like everyone else. Yep. Yep. They called me the splendid splinter, but now I, I, I got, I got nothing. I'm, I'm done for what did I really accomplish or what, what was the point of it all? Mm -hmm. And he has his friend's bedside there. Yeah. He didn't have to look very far to realize, Oh yeah, that's why it was worth it. Yep. It's that's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine the, the whole legacy conversation and some of these players showing up at each other's bedsides as they're dying. I really mm -hmm. have a hard time imagining that. And I don't mean that to just dis disregard their talents or anything like that, but when I think when I hear that conversation of legacy, I just roll my eyes because it's so out of their control and it so misses the point. Mm -hmm. Right. So frankly, I could care less what a person legacy is. I just care that they could get on the phone and, you know, it's like imagining Durant and Seth Curry going fishing or mm -hmm. skiing or something. Like that is such a cooler picture to me if it was a thing than anything else. Um, so I I I hear that. Um to wrap. So Two things, metaphor. So two metaphors that I, or similes that I got out of this. Friendship is like Gorilla Glue, kind of taking that Ted Williams concept. <laughs> Gorilla Glue is, is amazing, by the way. Great product. It should be affiliate. We should affiliate Gorilla Glue. Um, man, it stuff sticks so well. Like I've got it on my hands. It doesn't come off for days. Um, but you stick together, right? You know, it really <laughs> binds and sticks together. Run with me here for a second. This is funny. Just Taken um, back by how excited you got about Gorilla Glue. Really like you got some it. rasp in your voice. Like, oh, really yeah. Glue. yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to do that. Where can you find your books? Well, if your books ever fall apart, you can grill. <laughs> uh, if you have analog books like I do. Anyways, so that is one. Is is It's very sticky. It's a wonderful product. Wonderful thing. And it's a potluck. You know, friendship is really a potluck. Everybody brings something to the you know the table and it, it's fun when you have different things at a potluck like oh i got somebody's got the entree somebody's got the side somebody's got dessert somebody's got mac and cheese who, who knows what you're bringing to the potluck and that that's two that i saw i'm gonna take that to the next level it's a thematic potluck thematic it's, potluck. it's not just people bring like one person bringing spaghetti and the next person bringing tacos and the next person bringing curry everything works together so yeah. it is someone bringing tacos, someone bringing guacamole. You, you each have your part and your piece that complement the other. It's not just a free for all. I like that better. I think it, I think it could be more intentional, but a lot of times it is a free for all. 
The answer to your question, Jake, before we wrap up is our last thing, our goosh, our one more thing before we go, is the friendship dinner of Johnny Pesky. This is unbelievable. I got to I gotta share this. So the reason why I'm sharing at the end is, is that you need an excuse to get together. Like it's not, it can't always be a wedding or an illness. Like if you're not going to deliberately move next door to your friends, which is a thing. I mean, if, if you don't have the means to do that, it doesn't work out for you, whether it's in your working life or your retirement life. I want to talk to you about the friendship dinner, uh, the annual pesky dinner. He was such a local celebrity in, annually in Lynn. Um, they celebrated the fact that Johnny Pesky had remained throughout the years, Johnny Pesky. So they did, they had the official title called the Friendship Dinner, and it was a one of the major time warp occasions um, for in America. So the Friendship Dinner started back when John was still playing. This is a long time ago, okay? And a few of his neighbors would take him out to dinner the night before he left for spring training. That's when it started. The first time it happened, there were only eight to ten of them. They went to the local restaurant, had steaks, and then stayed for a few drinks. And it turned out to be an unusually warm and affectionate evening. Someone said at the very end. Hey, we ought to do this every year, someone said. John, loving it, protested that no, they shouldn't, that it was all too much of a fuss. But that made his pals even more determined and turned it into an annual event. That is, it would be an annual event even if it worked. And if it didn't, it would die out on its own accord. Of course, it worked, and it began to grow. A few more people attending each year as other friends heard about it and wanted in. Instead of eight friends, there were soon a dozen, then 20, and then one day over 100, and even larger venues were needed to hold everyone. There were still no women present. It was not in any way a stag party. There was no nothing smutty about it. There was always a mon, uh, mon. How do you say that wine thing, Monsignor? How do you say that? I always screw that Monsieur? one up. Yeah, whatever. They are the people who do the wine. <laughs> oh, um, Monsi a, con a connoisseur. No, it's M O N I S. I oh, whatever. Rather, it was like an old-fashioned father-son sports banquet. Other, often other Red Sox players showed up, and there were a number of years when Ted had come. In 2002, they had 50-year anniversary of the Johnny Pesky dinner. So goals. You want to talk about goals of friendship, having a 50-year annual something. Like, and I think once a year, I know the brutal math still doesn't like that, Jake, but having an excuse... Um, or manufacturing an excuse to get together is what lasts and what's worth it. So when do you think of something, Jake? You're in Arizona now. What's our excuse? What do we, what do we, we got to think of a thing. We do got to think of a thing. Johnny Pesky would be disappointed in us. Yeah, we'll have to come up with something. Something, absolutely something. Anything else for the good of the cause? We've been on it for a while. Um, I always say they're good episodes, but they're all good episodes. It's good stuff. So mm -hmm. it is good stuff. No, I liked it. It was uh, it was good to see a, a little insight into their lives and what was going on besides just Ted Williams smacking the ball around. You would never know otherwise. I mean, it's yep. fun to dig into the history of the game. We'll be sure to pick more of these like historical accounts as we look at other themes. But I, I I'm illuminated. I, I I love Ted Williams, the science of hitting. I read that as a kid. But to see him more as a human was fascinating to me, you know, in all his greatness and his weakness. So that said, everybody, thank you for tuning in um, and going the distance with us until the end. Uh, do, sh do be sure to get the book wherever books are sold, but we like bookshock.org, thrift books, Amazon, Audible, what have you. Read is the, one of the best ROIs you can have. Um, check out the other episodes that we have. So now we've covered, you know, the good life. And Coach Wooden and me, both those episodes under friendship, um, as well as our industriousness and enthusiasm episodes that went along with books as well. Um, be well, everybody. Never stop learning. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode where we cover Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence, and influence people. people to wrap up. I'm see looking you. forward to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See ya. See ya.